Good morning, everyone, to our Friday session for the Washington Soil Health Week. My name is Teal Potter. I'm a new postdoc at Washington State University and specifically at the Northwest Washington Research and Extension Center. And this morning, I'm glad to see a lot of you discovered um, that we're starting a little bit later because we only have one talk for this morning's session. Um, and a couple announcements that I'm going to make um, before we get started. Um, hopefully you've figured out by now that Google Chrome is uh, the best way to go for this um, platform. Um, if you are having te technical difficulties, there is a support chat widget in the bottom left of your screen that you can get some help at. Um, please do enter questions in the question bar on the right side of your screen. There'll be the question and answer session after the talk. And yeah, there will be a poll at the end of the session. So um, let's get started. Our speaker today is Dr. Linda Kinkle, um, who is a professor at the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Minnesota. Um, she will be talking to us today about disease suppressive soils and will be joined by a researcher, a researcher Marion Bolton, near the end of the talk. So with that, I think we're good to get started. Importantly, why did this suppressive soil develop in a particular potato production system? Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this year's SoilCon. Dr. Marion Bolton and I are excited to talk to you this morning about disease suppressive and healthy soil microbiomes, focusing primarily on potato production systems. Today, we're going to be covering four different topics. First, we're going to be looking at some simple definitions of disease suppressive soils, what are they? Second, we wanna explore some detailed data, asking questions about how, or more importantly, why did this suppressive soil develop in a particular potato production system? Third, we wanna translate the information that we've captured in the investigation of how a suppressive soil developed. We wanna translate that to the potential for managing soil communities for disease suppression. And finally, we wanna go much bigger and raise the concept of management for a healthy soil microbiome. That is a soil microbiome that supports crop health and productivity. All right, what are disease suppressive soils? I'm sure many of you already know what a disease suppressive soil, or how they're defined. In a nutshell, a disease suppressive soil is a soil in which disease, and usually one, maybe a couple of diseases have disappeared. That is, there are soils in which there's little to no disease on a susceptible crop, even when the pathogen is present. There are soils also in which introduction of a pathogen fails. Pathogens don't establish or survive in that soil. And there's many suppressive soils that have occurred after long-term successive cropping, in particular long-term monoculture. And many of you, especially in the Pacific Northwest, might be aware of uh, take-all suppressive soils, which are a function of long-term wheat monocropping. Today, I want to talk about a naturally occurring disease suppressive soil from northern Minnesota. And this is a, a soil that developed suppressive capacity against the disease potato scab after 30 plus years of potato monoculture. I do want to note this is not the only potato scab suppressive soil that has been developed over long term monoculture. There are soils in Washington state that was actually the first potato scab suppressive soil reported back in the 1950s in California, Maine. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So there's multiple examples of this phenomenon. And basically there was a plot in Northern Minnesota that was used for the potato breeding program. And the potato breeders planted potatoes every year in that field because it had such great disease pressure for scab. They knew if they brought potato cultivars up there, they could get a good assessment of their susceptibility to scab. Unfortunately, 
After 30 years of potato monoculture, scab disease, which is caused by the bacterium Streptomyces scabies, began to decline dramatically in, in that soil. And eventually the breeding program could no longer use that soil for the, for the nursery. In the 1990s, Dr. Neil Anderson, uh, the potato pathologist at Minnesota at the time, Dr. Neil Anderson and I returned to that soil and we planted potato multiple years trying to get a little bit of a feel for what had happened in that soil. And the first thing we did was look for pathogens. Had disease disappeared because the pathogen disappeared? And over three years, we looked intensively on potato production or potatoes grown in that field. We found no disease and we found no pathogens. But we found lots of streptomyces, that is members of that same bacterial genus in that soil. And studies of those bacteria in the lab show that they were really good at inhibiting lots of different plant pathogens, including the scab pathogen, as well as oomycetes, fungi, and even nematodes. And looking at this, this you'll note that this is a, almost a who's who of some of the worst soil-borne plant pathogens in agriculture. So the first thing we did as we were continuing to study this soil, we said, oh gosh, these streptomyces from the suppressive soil are really good at killing pathogens. Can we use them as inoculants in biological control? And I should note before showing you our biocontrol results, I got a moment ahead of myself here. The streptomyces, one thing that's important is to, to emphasize streptomyces are ubiquitous. There's nothing unusual about finding streptomyces in soil. They're literally everywhere. They're gram positive filamentous sapro saprophytes. The, the filamentous capacity allows them to move through soil by forming these hyphae. They're saprophytes. They grow on dead plant material and plant exudates. They're important in nutrient cycling in agricultural systems. They're important in clinical medicine. About three quarters of antibiotics that come from bacteria come from this single genus. So they're very bioactive, we say. As I noted, they're good at inhibiting major classes of plant pathogens. And another note that I'd like to, to, to point out about this genus in particular, they're also prolific producers of plant growth promoting hormones. When we look at this bacterial genus, which is ubiquitous in soils, it clearly has a long coevolutionary history with plants and tremendous potential to help make plants healthy and more productive. So back to our inoculative biocontrol, the first thing we did with microbes from the suppressive soil was the easiest thing. And that is we inoculated and asked whether we could control plant diseases. So this is a, a very early study we did. We took one really good pathogen killer from the suppressive soil. We inoculated it in a different field station about 250 miles away. We inoculated the potatoes on the left at planting in April. On the right, we have the non-inoculated tubers the tubers were harvested in September and we saw dramatic reductions in disease when we inoculated a single isolate from that disease suppressive soil. We've continued for 25 years to do inoculative studies on potato and, and actually multiple other crops, in particular alfalfa and soybean. And just to illustrate the broad potential of members of this bacterial genus to suppress disease, this is one of our other inoculative studies. This is a soil from the University of Minnesota campus that's naturally infested with the pathogen Phytophthora. We took soil from the field, we planted alfalfa in all of these pots, and the pots on the right, immediately after we planted the alfalfa seed, we inoculated one milliliter of 10 to the eighth spores of one of our really good pathogen killers. And 28 days later, you see that the inoculated plants are much larger, more vigorous, in fact, these plants are heavily infested, infected with the pathogen, the non-inoculated plants. The inoculated plants have no evident disease. And also because this strain is a really good growth promoter, they're quite vigorous. And so we, we did a lot of work and we continue to work to do work using inoculation as a means to increase the densities of these pathogen suppressive populations in soil. But even as we've continued to do inoculation work, it seemed to us the more important point was to understand that suppressive soil. That is, what happened in that soil? Why did that soil become suppressive? We knew that there were lots of streptomyces in that soil, and we knew that every soil has streptomyces. Is there something about the streptomyces in that soil community that led this move towards complete disease suppression? Now, unfortunately, that suppressive soil, the monoculture started back in the 1940s. 
And I was not yet doing science in the 1940s. Um, and so we don't have, we can't go back in time and we can't study what happened in that community over time. But what we did have at the experiment station where the suppressive soil developed, we had the suppressive soil plot, which is about a one and a quarter acre long-term potato monoculture. And immediately adjacent across the tractor alley, we had a conducive soil plot. And those two soils are indistinguishable in terms of N and P and K and, and soil structure, but they differed in their planting history. And so we zeroed in and we said, okay, maybe the first thing we need to do is find out comprehensively, we need to convince ourselves that are Streptomyces really critical to disease suppression? So we compared Streptomyces communities in the suppressive and adjacent conducive soil. And we said, okay, what might make that suppressive soil suppressive? Maybe it just has more Streptomyces. And we did find suppressive soils have significantly higher Streptomyces densities. There are more of them in soil in the suppressive than in the conducive soil. So more Streptomyces, that's one important correlative disease suppression. But maybe this capacity to kill pathogens is also really important and different in the two soils. So we asked, are streptomyces from suppressive soils better at killing pathogens? And to do this, we took a random collection of 300 streptomyces from the suppressive and 300 from the conducive soils. And we looked at their ability to kill 21 different plant pathogens. So all of those pairwise interactions, can each streptomyces kill pathogen one, two, three, and so on? And what we found was that the streptomyces from the suppressive soil were absolutely better at killing plant pathogens. That is, for any one of the 21 plant pathogens, the streptomyces from suppressive soil, a greater proportion of them could kill every one of the 21 pathogens. And equally importantly, the inhibition zone. Okay, so here we have, in the middle here, you see a streptomyces and you see this big zone of killing that's the inhibition zone. Inhibition zones among streptomyces from the suppressive soil were significantly greater than inhibition zones from streptomyces from the conducive soil. So streptomyces from suppressive soils are better at killing pathogens. So there's more of them. They're better at killing pathogens. And we ask one third question that we think is another critical piece of disease suppression and in particular understanding how we might create a disease suppressive soil through management. In particular, we said, okay, so there's lots of them. They're good at killing pathogens. Do they also produce more different kinds of antibiotic inhibitory substances? That is, do they have a greater diversity of killing capacities? And we did find that the suppressive streptomyces populations collectively had a much higher diversity of inhibitory phenotypes. In a nutshell, the suppressive soil streptomyces community was fundamentally and significantly different than the streptomyces community in the conducive soil and that there were more streptomyces, they were better at killing plant pathogens, and they had a wider diversity of phenotypes or chemical strategies for killing pathogens. And this was correspondent with disease suppression. So that's a description of how they differ. But remember, the question that we wanted to ask is why did that happen? How did that soil go from being conducive to disease to being profoundly and quite stably suppressive to disease on potatoes? And we actually think that these data provide a fairly straightforward process. They suggest a process. And in fact, we think it's a process that's reproducible in agriculture. And so what, what, was, what was unique about that conducive or suppressive soil, excuse me, Long-term potato monoculture. Well, let's think about long-term potato monoculture. Where do potatoes put their carbon? Potatoes pump carbon underground into big, juicy, carbon-filled tubers. And they also have root systems that turn over fairly rapidly. So this is a great recipe for feeding your saprophytes. Remember, streptomyces, they're saprophytes. They love plant resources and soil. So long-term monoculture potatoes, we argue, is a great recipe for enriching, increasing streptomyces densities. So now you've got lots of streptomyces in soil at densities two to five fold higher. They're all packed together more tightly in space. At this point with higher densities, your competitive interactions among those saprophytes will increase. This is when antibiotics are a benefit, right? There's a plate of cookies. I want those cookies. I kill you, I get all the cookies, I get all the carbon the fitness of antibiotic producers will increase and they'll become selectively abundant, predominant in the community 
in this high density selection event. So now you've got a community with lots of streptomyces that are producing antibiotics as they compete for resources. Then the next step we think that's a critical final step is frequency dependent selection. And so think for a moment, if we're all competing for cookies and soil, if we're all producing the same antibiotic, we're wasting our time because if you produce an antibiotic, in fact, you're resistant to that antibiotic. And so in this high density, highly antagonistic community, rare antibiotics, novel antibiotics will have a much greater fitness benefit. If you are clever enough to evolve or to obtain through horizontal gene transfer a new rare antibiotic, it'll have a much greater fitness benefit and you will selectively increase the diversity of antibiotics to this rare advantage. And so overall, these three very straightforward ecological steps we think are key to, to producing that high density and diversity of streptomyces that are antagonistic to pathogens, which really are, are, are a, a hallmark of this disease suppressive community. And so thinking about this, if we oversimplify it, it points to one simple step. Is this a recipe? Maybe it all starts with feeding the microbes. And so we said, okay, so the data suggests that this model could work, does it? Can we reproducibly create a disease suppressive soil? That is, can we manage soils to increase the densities and in, in inhibitory phenotypes of streptomyces? If we do that, will disease suppression result? And can we show that the focus on this one genus, this one group of microbes in this extraordinarily complex soil microbiome, is focusing management on a single target going to be sufficient for getting positive outcomes? So let me show you some results. How do we enrich streptomyces densities? Of course, we already showed that long-term potato monoculture, which was replicated in Washington, California, Wisconsin, et cetera, that's one way, but it doesn't make sense economically. Growers can't grow 30 years of potatoes because in the intervening years between one and 30, you would have a really crummy crop. So can we short circuit that? Can we feed the microbiome more deliberately? And I wanna go through some data where we've used both green manures and direct adding carbon to soil to feed soil microbiomes. And finally, if time permits, we'll touch on inoculation as a way to enrich antagonistic streptomyces. But the heart of what I wanna look at here is feeding soil microbiomes. So the first approach we've used is green manures. Now, of course, many potato growers in the Pacific Northwest in particular have used green manures actively. Green manures confer lots of benefits. We asked a really specific question. Can we use green manures to specifically enrich the pathogen killing activity of soil-borne indigenous naturally occurring streptomyces? So what we actually have measured over multiple field trials in different locations is when we use green manures, can we increase the number of streptomyces that kill different plant pathogens and the zone sizes of inhibition. So we have this soil borne acid, we take soil, we wash it, we plate it onto growth medium, we let all the naturally occurring microbes in soil grow on that medium for five days. Then we kill them and we overlay with a pathogen, the, the Streptomyces scabies, Fusarium oxysperum, Verticillium dahlia, and so on. I'm gonna to focus today on how the numbers of indigenous microbes that can kill these four potato pathogens are influenced by green manures. And this shows results from a two-year field trial. We did a fall green manure incorporation and grew potatoes the following spring. When we came back the following spring and we looked at, we compared the proportion of indigenous streptomyces that could inhibit four different potato pathogens following a fall buckwheat or canola green manure we found that against all four of these plant pathogens, we significantly increased proportions of streptomyces that could inhibit the pathogen. And so at multiple locations, we were able to reproducibly show that green manures can significantly increase the target population and its ability to kill pathogens. So we increased streptomyces inhibitory capacities. Did this result in disease suppression? in conjunction with the same trial in the, the second year following two successive fall green manure treatments, we found that buckwheat or canola green manures significantly reduced verticillium wilt as compared with the fallow or no green manure treatment. 
Similarly, in a related field trial where we had not only buckwheat, but also green manure, uh, canola and sorghum Sudan grass green manures, which I know have been used a lot out in the Pacific Northwest, where it, we were able to significantly reduce potato scab coverage following green manures. And finally, just to, to make the point that this green manure benefit extends to multiple crops and multiple pathogens, here we have the Oomycete phytophthora, following again the buckwheat, the oat, and the sedan grass green manure, we significantly reduce the percent of plants infected with phytophthora in a first year establishment plot of alfalfa. And so collectively, we, we found that the green manures could enhance our, ta our target microbiome population, suppress disease, but are those two connected, right? If we really care about identifying a management target, then we've got to make sure that our target is really the driver of the function, the disease suppression that we care about. Now, this is a little bit of a tougher call, and you might note this is still only correlation, not causation. But across both scab and verticillium infection, we see here we have on the x-axis the density of the antibiotic producing streptomyces, the indigenous populations in soil. We see that scab disease is significantly negatively correlated with streptomyces densities in soil, that is the antagonistic populations. For both verticillium wilt on potato and scab, more antibiotic producing streptomyces is significantly, cor significantly negatively correlated with disease, right? More streptomyces that produce antibiotics against pathogens, less disease. And that's at multiple field locations over multiple seasons. And so we found, in fact, the green manures could increase this target population in the soil microbiome. They could reduce intensities, and those two things were significantly correlated, which for us was very exciting because it suggests that this model idea that we can manage those indigenous communities to achieve a functional outcome is possible. But green manures, especially in the north central U.S., are a tough sell for growers. Growers cannot take a year out of production economically to establish a, a strong, vigorous, high above ground biomass green manure that's necessary for this management. And we, to, to fit a green manure in a growing season with an with a, a economically valuable crop is really a tough sell. It's a tough thing to do. So in the meantime, we said, okay, is there a shortcut? Green manures are awesome. Long-term monoculture, great outcome. Green manure is awesome. But can we shorten that timeline even further? Instead of green manures that take, you know, however many weeks it takes seed, it takes pass, it, additional passes of the tractor, it takes irrigation. What if we just feed the microbiome directly? What if we just add soil carbon? And related to this, I have a question for, for our community. We have thought about plant nutrition for decades, for centuries, literally. We know N, P, K micronutrients. It's time for us to similarly put just as much energy into microbial nutrition. Feeding microbiomes, what does a healthy microbiome need to function to support our agricultural production system? So we begin to try to, to crack that nut. And I'm gonna, just gonna show one short experiment here. This was an experiment where we took soil from prairie and agricultural sites across a real wide range of organic matters from low organic matter to high. We put the soil into jars that we called mesocosms and we sealed them. And we fed the soil little tiny bits of carbon every other week. It says weekly, but it was actually every other week for nine months. And the total amount of carbon we put into soil was actually quite small. We scaled that to the amount of carbon that a, 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 a plant would put into the soil over a growing season. And we've used lots of different nutrients. I'm gonna focus on three simple nutrients, glucose, fructose, lignin, or a mixture. And we ask a simple question. If we feed the soil microbiome, can we increase the frequency of antibiotic producers? Can we cut out that green manure or long-term soil monoculture and directly manage this population? And to show what we did here after the, at the end of the experiment where we fed these communities over time, we then randomly collected 100 streptomyces from the different treatments. And on the y-axis, we have the percent of those streptomyces that were pathogen inhibitory. The control, we only gave the soil water every other week when we fed the populations glucose, fructose, or the mixture of nutrients, we found statistically significant increases. As a matter of fact, up to threefold bumps 
in the frequency of pathogen inhibitors in that community. And so carbon amendments, finding microbial nutritional approaches to managing that microbiome we think has tremendous potential for our field. So overall disease suppressive soils, many of us, I'm looking at uh, scab suppression. Of course, the, the Pacific Northwest has a rich heritage of wonderful work from Dave Weller and, and, and Tim Pollitz and, and the entire group out there for take all suppression. We're beginning to peel back the layers to understand how to target populations and manage them actively to achieve these functional outcomes for crop production. Uh, we think that microbial nutritional needs are an incredible, incredibly important element of soil health that's been under-recognized. And there's a, a, a huge need to begin to understand my, the generalizability of microbiome responses to management. And in our space, we're trying to understand that with respect to disease suppression. This is a, a, a game shifter for many of us in the field in terms of management, rather than thinking of managing the pathogen population or even managing the crop, how do we start thinking about managing the microbiome? And I wanna note, we focus strongly on an individual population, but the healthy soil, soil microbiome is of course so much more complex and diverse and rich. And there are 10 to the 10th or more genomes in a little tiny, the tip of my fingertip of soil. And functionally, these microbiomes suppress diseases, they enhance crop yields, they capture nutrients, they help recycle nutrients, they can sequester soil to add greater ecosystem value. How do we begin to manage these? The challenge for us is we're still not precisely sure what a healthy, quote unquote, soil microbiome looks like. And we're just beginning to peel back who is there and what functions are most important. And in fact, who's there and what functions are most important certainly varies among different crop targets. And so towards this end, I'm, I wanna turn over the, the last bits of, the, of this talk to Dr. Marion Bolton, who's a research scientist who's leading one key element of the National Potato Soil Health Project, which is taking a crop specific, geogra geographically extensive and very data rich dive to try to develop a foundation for soil microbiome management for healthy, productive potato systems. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bolton. So hello, my name is Marion Bolton. And as Linda said, I am in charge of working on the soil microbial community portion of this large national potato soil health project. And before I get into the details of what we're looking at with the soil microbiome for this national project, I think it's important to set the context for why soil health is so critical in potato production systems and why growers are very concerned about soil health, particularly in potato production systems. And that's because potato production is pretty intensive on the soil. Each year before a potato is planted, there's fumigation that occurs in almost every single potato plot and also tillage, deep tillage that occurs in order to get your plants into the ground and for ease of harvest as well. And as you can imagine, that causes a lot of soil carbon loss. It causes chemical and physical damage to the microbial community in the soil. And why is that important? Well, we know that the microbial communities in the soil are critical for plant health and productivity, especially in potato production systems where your tubers are coming into direct contact with the soil and the microbial community surrounding them. So with this national project, we're really interested in understanding how our soil management practices can be used to mitigate some of these negative impacts on soil physical chemistry, as well as the soil microbiome that occur with fumigation and tillage and other extensive potato production practices. But in order to do that, we really have to understand a few things about the soil microbiome. So that leads me to what our core questions are for this project. So what is a healthy soil microbiome for potato production systems? And I think it's important for us to set the context of defining a healthy soil microbiome. We don't really know what that looks like yet, but what we can try to do is define it within the context of what we're interested in getting from that soil microbial community. And in this case, that is a soil microbial community that can sustainably produce healthy potatoes over a period of time. So what we're interested in doing on this national platform is looking at different production systems and different management strategies that foster microbiomes associated with decreased disease and increased tuber yield. And if we can identify maybe what certain characteristics look like, what community structures of healthy microbiomes look like, 
or if there's core members that are continually associated with increased yield and decreased disease pressure, can we use these management practices to foster these healthier beneficial microbial communities in situations that maybe the soil has been depleted of soil carbon or has um, low microbial biomass. And additionally, not only can we see if these management practices influence the microbial communities for uh, plant productive uh, characteristics, but also what is the variability of this on a grower field scale? Are microbiome something that we can actually manage on a grower scale? And that leads me to the strength of this national project. We have 10 different states participating on this grant and it's a four year project of 24 different collaborators, including small research plot trials as well as grower field trials. And this gives us the rare ability to be able to look at soil microbiome hypotheses, not only over space, but also over time and at different spatial scales as well. So we're able to assess how different treatments, um, some that are consistent across states and some that are tailored specifically to those regions and what those grower practices are, um, we're able to see how they interact with the soil microbial community and how those differences in microbial communities impact tuber yield and quality. And we're also able to do grower field trials at a fine scale to understand how a single microbial community varies within a given field so that we understand if it's even feasible to manage microbiomes at a field level. So how do you go about optimizing a soil microbiome for potato health and productivity? Well, when I keep talking about management practices, originally and typically we think about, okay, if we implement a management practice, it's gonna have X, Y, or Z result on your potato health or your yield. So if you fumigate, you reduce disease and you have an impact on your potato health. But what we're interested in doing is breaking this down into finer scales. So not just looking at how the management practice impacts potato health and yields, but how the management practices themselves are impacting soil health in general. So when I say that, I mean, how is the management practice influencing the soil microbial community, as well as the physical chemical characteristics of that soil and then in return, how do these changes in these two components of what we're looking at for soil health impact the potato health and yield? And by doing this, we hope that we can have a more fine and refined scale of understanding the impact of management practices on soil microbiomes and how those play into potato yield and health for more optimized control. And I keep mentioning all these management practices. Well, what are we doing at this national scale? So as I mentioned previously, we have certain management practices that are kept the same between all 10 states present on the project. And that's to allow us to look at key impacts of fumigation or rotation diversity, rotation length and cover cropping at a national scale but we also have state specific treatments that are tailored for those regions and what those growers are really interested in. But they use a different combination of man management strategies. And those include crop variety, whether it's um, susceptible or resistant to different diseases in the soil, different lengths of crop rotation, if it's two or three year crop rotations, fumigation, if you're fumigating or not, cover crops, there's different types of cover crops, um, green manures or soil amendments and biologicals that are added. And all of these different combinations, we're trying to assess how the soil microbial community changes and if these changes are associated with high potato yields and disease suppressive soils. So I know that's kind of a lot to cover, but we have two main goals that we wanna get out of this national platform. The first is to be able to identify what characteristics even are of a healthy soil microbiome, specifically for potato production systems across the country? Do these look the same across a national platform? Or do we really have to tailor healthy soil microbiomes to very specific regions and what that innate soil uh, physical chemical characteristics are? How do those interact and inter interplay to create a healthy soil um, community for potato production? And secondly, to determine if we can find these healthy soil microbiomes, what management tools can we best use to enhance soil microbial communities for improved potato production at a national level? So that's really the exciting thing with this 
progress or this pro uh, project that we're going to be able to do this on a national scale and assess this over multiple years to give growers um, a really comprehensive definition of what soil health looks like for potato production systems, especially in relation to potato soil microbiomes. And with that, I will tag off to Linda Kinkle to give acknowledgements for her talk as well. And thanks to everybody who listened. We'd love it to address any questions you might have, but I want to acknowledge the awesome scientists who have come through our, our program. I want to acknowledge the funding support of the USDA in particular in our research, the support of the potato industry in writing a letter campaign and great support for us to get the national project. And uh, with that, any questions? We look forward to visiting. So thank you, Linda and Marion, for that great talk. And we do have some questions rolling in. So if you're in full screen right now and you want to ask a question, you can minimize that. And you'll see on the right side that there's a chat box that you can enter your questions. So starting out, we got at this a little bit, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts a little bit more on diversity, since we learned from you that monocropping um, actually eventually leads to disease suppressive soils. Um, is the con the opposite true? Is more diversity in your crops or even cover crops? Does that sort of delay the suppression? That's a really great question. And I saw uh, Carol ask that partway through and I immediately uh, chatted teal. I said, oh, we've got to address that one. Uh, of course, we'd never recommend long-term monoculture in management. and not all monocultures lead to disease suppression. We're currently studying, a, it's, a, it's a, about 62 years now of monoculture and experiment that, that it was actually established back in the 50s in Minnesota with corn, soybean, oat, wheat, and barley monocultures with and without NPK and with and without uh, residue amendment. And clearly there's really different trajectories that those soil microbiomes can take. Diversity is a factor that can mediate the, the extent to which a community becomes uh, highly antagonistic, but it's not a very simple story. And, and so monoculture good is not the, the simple answer that I'd come up with, but, but clearly for potatoes, long-term monoculture in, in quite different geographic locations has generated highly antagonistic communities. So short answer is monoculture, we'd never recommend it and we have more to learn, but um, the nutritional status of soils in some monocultures clearly seems to support antagonistic communities. Great, and slightly more specific, but, but related, I think um, in one of the experiments where you added green manure, there was an observation, there was higher suppression in, um, um, due to the green manure, but was that observed in the soil or in the plants themselves or both? That was in the soil. And what we did in that, I, I saw a couple of those questions and it relates a little to timing too. We would plant our green manures in August after we harvested a sweet corn crop. We would incorporate them in early October and we used a rotavator to do that. The potatoes then of course wouldn't be planted till the next spring, but we would assess the communities both in the fall and then at multiple time points over the growing season. And it would be the soil communities, because of course, once we've rotivated that green biomass into the soil, um, there's a lot going on, but it's mostly that soil community that we really care about most. Are we shifting that, that soil matrix into which the new crop will be planted and the microbiome that, that new crop will experience? Great, and also on the topic of green manure, could you take a little time to explain a little bit more about the management methods, um, specifically what time of year were those green manures planted um, and what, how were they terminated and, and incorporated and what timing for that? So in our field trials, we would, we would usually did a sweet corn because sweet corn was a short enough season that we could get a planting in and get enough biomass for incorporation. We of course didn't want to kill, we just wanted to incorporate the green biomass. So we would rotivate in that crop usually in early October. Um, and then the potatoes would be planted the following spring. So it would be in lieu of fumigation, the fall preceding potato. 
We also did a lot of these trials in greenhouse pots. And in that case, we would grow the crop. We would take each pot out. We would you know, chop it up and, and, and try to by hand simulate incorporation. And then we would look at the resulting microbiome at three weeks and six weeks and so on past that incorporation time, trying to ask how quickly could things happen. Great. Um, another question in reference to the long-term potato monoculture crops. Mm -hmm. um, were chemicals used to manage disease in on those fields? And if so, do you have thoughts on what the impact of those kinds of chemicals would be on the development of the streptomycete populations? That's another great question. Uh, certainly standard fertilization, uh, so NPK were utilized. There was no disease management, but there were insecticides. The, the nursery was really about trying to figure out uh, resistance or susceptibility to plant pathogens. And so um, insecticides and, and you know, nutrients were amended, but, but no fungicides were used in those plots. How might that influence, um, how might fungicides influence the development of disease suppressive communities or not? I can't give you a simple answer to that yet, but we do have a long-term experiment. It's actually in a prairie. It's not in a, an agricultural field, but it's a prairie field that since 2008 has, a, it's a randomized complete block. And in that 2000, since 2008, there have been regular application of foliar fungicides or soil-borne fungicides or both and neither. And we're looking at how that influences the soil microbiome collectively, but also the pathogen antagonistic activity. We do think that those plants that have um, received regular fungicides actually have more potential to, through root exudates, effectively feed their soil microbiomes um, to achieve beneficial outcomes. So there's some interesting, you're asking a really great question. I thought, I, I wish I could answer better, but, but certainly there's some interesting above below ground connections that we need to figure out. Great. This is awesome that we're getting some more some more detail. Um, so I think this is related to the mesocosm experiment where you added carbon. The um, question is, are you able to comment on the use of lignin? And I'm not sure if that's the choice or the outcome of that particular treatment, but that's... I can touch on both of those. We actually had a, a much larger array of, of carbon compounds we chose from super simple like glucose, like everybody in soil can eat glucose or can me metabolize or break down glucose. Then we had cellulose and intermediate and then lignin, which is of course mostly fungi. Streptomyces can break down lignin as well. We were trying to choose nutrients that varied in terms of how much of that soil microbiome could, could benefit from those. Uh, lignin we did use in some larger scale field trials. I didn't present any data from our <clears throat> carbon amendments in the field. Lignin had some really interesting and awesome effects on soil microbiomes, but it also had a tendency to clump up and change the water uh, movement in the soil. So in the long run, lignin did some really neat things. I think agronomically it's completely impractical, but it, it's taught us some things that I think are helping us continue to, to move forward about, okay, what are the role of these, these simple, moderately complex and really complex carbon substrates, what are their differential roles in soil microbiome or soil microbial nutrition? Great, and we just have a minute left. Um, so I'll ask another question, but for our audience members, a poll should be popping up if it hasn't already, if you could please do that. And we do have more questions than we have time to answer here. So if you do wanna to look up our speakers, there's information on the website, um, and we will also be providing resources um, after, from the speakers after the conference. So I guess a final question here is, um, what are you thinking about in terms of technology and tools for understanding the microbiome itself? Are you using DNA sequencing, um, analytical approaches? Maybe Marianne could speak to this too. Um, what's maybe exciting for understanding the microbiome piece? Yeah, I can touch on this. Uh, I think someone was kind of asking what our approaches are in terms of identifying the microbiome. And right now, we're, since we have so many samples, the best option for us was to do amplicon sequencing. So looking at the bacterial and the fungal communities with 16S and ITS sequencing. Um, but there are limitations with that because it's really just an identification of who's there. We are trying to look into rearranging some funding or seeing if we can acquire some more funding to 
do two additional things. Um, PLFA to look at absolute biomass so that we can try to correlate um, absolute biomass with the different taxonomic community members. And also maybe even on a subset of the samples, look at some metagenomics to see what genes are present um, or key genes that we're interested in throughout all of the different cropping systems that we have across the national platform. But at the moment, we are just using amplicon sequencing. Although I should note that in other projects, we're also doing a lot of uh, microbial functional, especially pathogen suppressive and, and microbial nutrient use preferences. And I just want a quick answer, Con, um, Conrad, or Con, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce your question correctly. But yes, organic matter in soil is really critical, but carbon still tends to be limiting to microbial growth. So even though a high organic matter might have a lot of carbon, the billions of microbes there are always hungry for more, and it's what we feed them directly or inadvertently that can fundamentally change their dynamics in ways that really influence crop productivity. Great. Thanks for those comments. That's super helpful for me too. And I think we are going to wrap it up here because um, we're at the hour. So thank you so much to our speakers. Um, I hope that you consider joining the last couple sessions that we have in this conference. And if you have not completed the poll, please do that so we can get some feedback. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Thank you.